Among the great variety of evil factions in Sauron's army, there is one group who stands a cut above the rest, the elites. The men with the greatest potential to do good, and the greatest capacity to inflict evil. A la Tulia Meldonia Ahara Mariese, my name's Rainbow Dave, and welcome to another Tolkien Untangled lore video. So today I'll be telling the story of how some of the greatest men ever to live in Arda fell in league with the Dark Lord Sauron, and how they cemented themselves as some of the most deadly enemies of all the Free Peoples. But before I can dive into the lore of the Black Numenorians, first we need to understand the importance of the Numenorians themselves. And this is a huge topic, and you know, I'm definitely going to do a whole series of videos about Numenor in the future, but what's important right now for this video is that the Numenorians were completely unlike any other men in Middle-earth. In fact, they're not even from Middle-earth, they're from the island of Numenor. And way back in the beginning of the Second Age, the Numenorians were the most amazing group of people. Their first king was actually Elrond's brother, a guy called Elros, and just like his niece Arwen will eventually do, Elros chose to live a mortal life. He chose the gift of men. But that doesn't mean the Numenorians were like other men. In the beginning, they spoke Elvish, specifically Sindarin, and they had incredible skill at sailing and at crafting and at law. Also, these guys were super tall. We're told that the average Numenorean stood at two Rangar tall, which is a bit more than six foot four. By the way, a Rangar is a Numenorean measurement that Tolkien invented, and it is roughly equivalent to the full length of a Numenorean stride. But Elendil, that's the father of Isildur, we are specifically told that he stood at seven foot eleven. Now, if you guys are American basketball fans, then Shaquille O'Neal, by comparison, he stands at seven foot one. And you know the dude who played the mountain in Game of Thrones? He is only six foot nine. I guess there's a reason he's remembered as Elendil the Tall. But I guess perhaps more significant than their height is the Numenorean's lifespan. Elros himself lived for 500 years. And even the average Numenorean is said to live five times longer than normal men, or middlemen, as they're called by Tolkien. That's about 350 years. But, and this is very important in what I'm going to talk about, Numenorians are not immortal. They are men. They are subject to the gift of men, and thus they must eventually die. Now, as the centuries and the millennia wore on, this gift of mortality became a serious problem. Many of the men of Numenor began to fear and resent death, and their fear led them down a truly dark and destructive path. Which brings us to the Black Numenorians. Now, if you've seen the last video that I made, the one about the Nazgul, then you'll know that there were three Numenorean lords who achieved their ambition of immortality, at least for a few thousand years, and they did so by taking rings from Sauron, the Great Deceiver. Now, in the Silmarillion, there's a whole section about Sauron's relationship with the island of Numenor and his role in its eventual, spoiler, destruction. And honestly, it's one of my favourite stories in the entire Legendarium. I think it's absolutely awesome. But if I start talking about it now, this video is going to be hours long. So I'll save that for another day. Although, if you are interested, I do go into a bit of detail on that in my Sauron video. So check that out after this one if you want to. I'll leave a link in the description. Anyway, what I will spend this video talking about is the Black Numenorians who left their island nation and came to settle in the lands of Middle-earth. And these guys will go on to become the great enemy of the kingdom of Gondor. But the very first Numenorians, the very first ones ever to come to Middle-earth, they were neither conquerors nor colonizers. They were, by all accounts, pretty decent people. 
They were friends and teachers to the native middlemen of Middle Earth. And these middlemen would be the ancestors of, like, the men of Rohan, or the men of Bree, or the men of Dunland, or the men of Dale. But as the millennia wore on, the visiting Numenorians turned from allies to straight-up conquerors. And instead of giving things to the middlemen, they began plundering their treasures and forcing them to pay enormous tributes to Numenor. And the descendants of these cruel colonizers, they became known as the Black Numenorians. But despite what we see, I guess, in a lot of adaptations, there is no mention by Tolkien of any Black Numenorians journeying into the North and allying themselves with the evil forces of Angmar. It's pretty common in video games, but it's not what Tolkien wrote. Instead, in the books, the Black Numenorians were colonizers of the South, and their stronghold was in the coastal city of Umbar. Now, Umbar is probably a familiar name to most of you, as it is from Umbar that the Corsairs in The Lord of the Rings sail from. But back in the Second Age, way before The Lord of the Rings, Umbar was the chief vice kingdom of the Black Numenorians. However, despite what we'll see later, back in the very beginning, Umbar was not actually allied with Sauron. In fact, it was used by the last king of Numenor in his war against Sauron. But just as Sauron's influence eventually spread to dominate all of Numenor, so too did his influence spread to the Black Numenorian colony of Umbar. And when the island of Numenor was eventually destroyed, all that remained of their culture were three exiled kingdoms of the Dúnedain. In the north, there was Arenor, the king's land that was ruled by Elendil, and thousands of years later, by Aragorn. In the middle, there was the land of stone, better known as Gondor, which was ruled by Isildur and his brother, and also thousands of years later, by Aragorn. But in the south, there was a much less talked about kingdom of the Numenorians, Umbar. And although the Dúnedain of Arnor and Gondor were elf friends, they were the descendants of those who remained faithful to the old ways, the Dúnedain of Umbar were mighty and evil. But I think it is worth noting that there was a time when Umbar would have been just as great and powerful as Gondor. In fact, considering that it's thousands of years older, I'm sure there was a time when Umbar was the greatest kingdom of men in all of Middle-earth. That's worth bearing in your mind, because although we don't know much about Umbar's history, other than its wars with Gondor, we do know that towards the end of the Second Age, it was ruled by two black Numenorian lords called Herumor and Fuinur. And just as the Gondorian Dúnedain intermarried with some of the middlemen over time, so too do the dark Dúnedain of Umbar except the men that they mix with are the Haradrim. We are told that Herumor and Fuinur rose to great power amongst the Haradrim, and over time Umbar became populated with many of the men from the vast and varied kingdoms of Harad. And there's something really cool to speculate about here, because by the time of the Lord of the Rings, we see that in Gondor, there is no longer any kind of clear, visible distinction between Gondorians of Numenorian descent and Gondorians of Middlemen descent. But there are a few individuals, like Faramir and like his father Denethor, in whom Tolkien says the blood of Numenor ran nearly true. Now, I worry that this may open up a whole can of worms about things like racial purity and bloodlines and all that kind of nonsense, which is absolutely not what this channel's about. But what I do find interesting to think about is that presumably there would also be men amongst the Haradrim of Umbar who have Numenorian blood that runs nearly true, right? Or whatever that means. So perhaps there are some Haradrim individuals that are, by, I don't know, some vague definition of a higher descent than the average guy. 
Anyway, we're not told much more about the Black Numenoreans of the Second Age, although I feel like it can be said with a fair degree of certainty that they would have fought alongside Sauron and against the Dúnedain of Gondor and Arnor in the War of the Last Alliance. We know that after Sauron's defeat in that war, the might of the Black Numenoreans declined, and their numbers became mixed with the warrior men of Harad. But we are also told that these warrior men inherited, without lessening, their hatred of Gondor. And there certainly were some Black Numenoreans left by the dawn of the Third Age. So, in the relatively early centuries of that Third Age, the twelfth King of Gondor, who was a guy called Taranon Falastur, finally brought Umbar under the dominion of Gondor after winning many battles against his ancestral enemies. But in order to maintain the peace, he took as his wife a lady from amongst the Black Numenorians. Her name was Beruthiel, and we're told that she was nefarious, solitary, and loveless. She was also Gondor's only Black Numenorian queen. Now, Beruthiel's entire existence is basically one really interesting extended fun fact. So as I've already mentioned, Beruthiel was not what you'd call a nice person. In fact, what Beruthiel literally means in Sindarin is angry queen. And in the Unfinished Tales, we're told that she hated all making, all colours and elaborate adornment, wearing only black and silver, and living in bare chambers. And the gardens of the house in Osgiliath were filled with tormented sculptures. So, I think it's safe to say she had some rather uh, unconventional attitudes to interior and exterior design. But the main point of interest in regards to Beruthiel is her cats. Beruthiel had a ton of cats, ten to be specific, but what's weird is that we're specifically told Beruthiel was not a cat person. Like, she loathed them. And yet, they just kind of followed her. I feel like I know people like that. You know, people who really don't like cats, but cats always seem to be attracted to them for some reason. Anyway, Beruthiel had nine black cats, and she had one white cat. And these cats were her slaves. But, also, just to be kind of creepy, Beruthiel could read their memories and converse with her cats, and she used the nine black ones as spies to discover all the dark secrets of Gondor, so that she knew those things that men wish most to keep hidden. No man in Gondor dared touch them, all were afraid of them and cursed when they saw them pass. But that's not even it, because Beruthiel then used her one white cat to spy upon the black ones, tormenting them. So yeah, like I said, Beruthiel, not a nice lady. And because she's, uh, well, not a nice lady, Beruthiel was eventually banished from Gondor by her own husband, and her name was eventually erased from the Book of Kings. She was set adrift alone on a ship with <laughs> her ten cats, and the last that any Gondorian ever saw of her was her ship flying past Umbar with a cat at the masthead and another as a figurehead upon the prow. <laughs> How nuts is that? I mean, Beruthiel's probably not the worst black Numenorian ever to live, but she certainly is one of the strangest. Anyway, I couldn't possibly do a video on this topic without talking about the most famous of all the Black Numenorians, the Lieutenant of Baradur, a guy so devoted to the Dark Lord that he forgot his own name, the Mouth of Sauron. Now, the origins of the Mouth of Sauron are very mysterious, and also worded really confusingly. So, in the book, we are told that he came of the race that were named the Black Numenorians. Straightforward enough, really. But then we're told that he entered the service of the Dark Tower when it first rose again. So what does that mean? It first rose again? 
Well, we can break it down. Sauron originally began building the Dark Tower of Barad-dûr way back for the very first time in the 1000th year of the Second Age, although it took him at least 600 years to complete it. But then Sauron went off to Numenor and his body got destroyed there along with the entire island and he didn't return to Barad-dûr to rise again until the year 3320 of the Second Age. So it's possible that this is when the mouth of Sauron joined the Dark Lord's service, although that would make him over 3000 years old by the time of the Lord of the Rings. And I mean, it's not impossible. We are told that he learned great sorcery, so perhaps he was able to extend his life. But I feel like this interpretation raises a lot more questions than it does answers. The alternative is simply that the mouth of Sauron entered the service of the Dark Tower when it rose again towards the end of the Third Age, in the year 2953. This would mean that the mouth of Sauron is only about 68 years old when we meet him in Return of the King, but that does seem a lot more plausible, considering the whole point of the Numenorians is that they can't live forever. Although, I will say, both versions are possible. Anyway, just like Baruthiel, the mouth of Sauron is a really despicable dude. In fact, he's probably way worse than Baruthiel. We are told that he was enamoured of evil knowledge. And because of his cunning, he grew ever higher in the Dark Lord's favour, and knew much of the mind of Sauron. And he was more cruel than any orc. Now, that's pretty much all we get in the published Lord of the Rings, but in some of Tolkien's earlier drafts, that can be found in a book called The War of the Ring, it's suggested that the mouth of Sauron may once have been a child that was snatched by Sauron and enslaved by his will. And in the same earlier drafts, we're told that his name may once have been Mordu, which according to the Encyclopedia of Arda means Black Darkness. And I find that these older, and to be honest, really non-canonical accounts lend a degree of humanity to the mouth of Sauron that actually make me feel kind of bad for him. Like, if he was a child that just got snatched by Sauron, and then got tortured, and then got corrupted, and then got dominated, that's really sad. But anyway, if we take a look at the movies, the Mouth of Sauron scene is one of my absolute favourites. I remember the first time I saw it, I got really pumped when Aragorn cut his head off. I was like, yeah, kill that guy. But if you stop and think about it, murdering an unarmed messenger during a parlay is like the least honourable thing Aragorn could possibly have done. I mean, don't get me wrong, it is badass to watch, but it's very much not what a noble king like Aragorn would do. And it's not what happens in the book. In fact, in the books, the mouth of Sauron's ending is never given. Perhaps he died in the Battle of Morannon, or perhaps he escaped. Perhaps he created his own Sauron-worshipping faction that continued long into the Fourth Age. We just don't know. His fate is a mystery. But before we close the book on the Black Numenorians, there is one more group that I have to talk about. And that group are the famous Corsairs of Umbar. So, by the second half of the Third Age, the men of Umbar were as much descended from the Haradrim as from the Black Numenorians, but their Numenorian heritage did make them vigilant enemies of the other Dúnedain kingdom just to the north, Gondor. Now, I know I did say that King Taranon Falastur made peace with Umbar by marrying Beruthiel, but let's not forget, he did also banish her, so... Ugh. And I do think it's possible that this banishment is a part of what inspired the centuries of war that followed. So, Taranon's great nephew was a guy called Kyriandil. And it was during his reign that men of Harad, led by lords that had been driven from Umbar, aka Black Numenorians, came up with great power, and Kyriandil fell in battle. But Kyriandil had a son, and the son's name was Kyriahair, although Kyriahair is much better known in the histories of Gondor by his nickname, 
Hiamendakil, the victor of the south. For Hiamendakil's armies utterly defeated the men of Harad, and their kings were compelled to acknowledge the overlordship of Gondor. However, that is not the end of the Corsairs of Umbar. So, in the following centuries, there was a Gondorian civil war called the Kinstrife, which I don't have time to go into right now, but I will say the Corsairs were a very relevant part of that war, and they continued to harass and harry the coastline of Gondor for thousands of years. Which brings us all the way to the reign of Steward Denethor's father, Steward Ecthelion II. And, as I've talked about in other videos, Ecthelion had in his service a mysterious counsellor who the Gondorians called Thorangil. And Thorangil was not just a wise man, but also an incredible captain. He went on Ecthelion's behalf all the way into Umbar, where he launched a devastating surprise attack against the Corsairs. In fact, not only did Thorangil burn much of the Corsair's fleet, he even killed the captain of Umbar in a one-on-one -on -one duel upon the Keys. Now, all of you guys who are in the know will already be aware why Thorangil is such an important part of the story, because Thorangil is the secret identity of young Aragorn. Well, I mean, I say young Aragorn, the dude was like 49 when this happened, but then he went on to live for like 210 years, so relatively, yeah, he was young Aragorn. Anyway, this of course is not Aragorn's final battle with the Corsairs of Umbar. In Return of the King, we are told about a great battle at Pelagir, which is kind of like the faithful Numenorean's ancient equivalent of Umbar. And here, Aragorn, now wielding the reforged sword of Elendil and commanding a force of Gondorian warriors from the Outlands, as well as the Grey Companies with rangers from Arnor and the twin sons of Elrond and his buddies Legolas and Gimli and also the entire army of Oathbreakers that he summoned, is able to drive off and defeat the Corsairs of Umbar for the final time. The battle at Pelagia effectively turns the Battle of Pelennor Fields into a victory, and that turns the tide of the War of the Ring. So, when we look at the role of the Black Numenorians in Tolkien's Legendarium, the main thing that I'm struck by is how, for all intents and purposes, they aren't really any different from the other Numenorians, the Dúnedain of Gondor and Arnor, except that the Black Numenorians are psychologically polluted by this all-consuming fear of death. Their pride and their obsessive ambition to overcome the very mortality that makes them men leads them into the service of the Deceiver, the very same Dark Lord who made them exiles of Numenor in the first place. And as is always the case with Tolkien's writing, this lack of faith and this mix of arrogance and insecurity ultimately leads to their downfall. By the time of the Lord of the Rings, all that's left of Black Numenorean culture is diluted down into the Corsairs of Umbar, who are finally defeated by the descendants of the faithful Numenorians from both Arnor and Gondor, united by the heir of Isildur, the very same guy who goes on to marry the niece of Numenor's first king. I guess the Black Numenorians show us that even, or perhaps especially, those with the greatest potential can still be corrupted by fear and deception. But they also show us that the faithful will eventually overcome. Now, I guess if you're a religious person, that faith may be very literal, but if you're not religious, I still think Tolkien's message applies. We are, all of us, mortals. We are all subject to fear and deception and corruption. Mortality is something that all of us share. But not all Numenorians 
were black Numenorians. Even at the very end, there are still some men of Arinor and Gondor, not to mention Rohan and Dale and a ton of other places, who resisted their fear of death, who stood beside Aragorn and fought against the Deceiver. Anyway, thank you all very much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like and a comment with your thoughts, and be sure to hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss the next video, in which I will be talking all about Thranduil, the elven king of the Woodland Realm. So, stay tuned for that, but as always, until then, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine. <laughs>